So it's just going to be the Brock O'Hearn Fit app, which there's nothing wrong with that because, yeah, you know. Yeah, standard. Yeah, I've built a brand over the past 10 years, and, you know, people know that I, I like to work out, you know, and I, I've studied this You're for years. You're not fit, bro. What are you talking <laughs> I'm about? I'm working on it every day. You're listening to Studio 22. We're going nowhere. Welcome to Studio 22. We're on a train with a one-way ticket to nowhere. Thank you, Brock, for that opener. <laughs> Back to you, Brock. That's from Spider-Man. You don't remember? Which one? Toby? Toby, yeah. Do you remember? I mean, he, he didn't say exactly what I just said. I just made it applicable for what we're doing. <laughs> um, but no, you don't remember that? Which, wait, which one? Uh, R- R- um, Randy Savage, Macho Man. You're going oh, nowhere. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> The yeah. um, I was thinking the train scene because I had applied trains to it. Yeah, yeah. Um, that was a cage match. In the original, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I'm saying we're locked in now, so we're going nowhere. We're locked in. You're locked in with us. All right, man. We haven't done, uh, I mean, I don't know, maybe it's been a month since we did a one-on-one, right? Or did we do one recently? Yeah, I mean, we're definitely going to do a little catch-up here. We have some interesting topics and updates, absolutely. Yeah, let's give them a brief overview of what we're going to touch on, just so you guys know what we're getting into right out the gate. All right. We will touch on um, Kane issue number four, our comic book that's coming out very, very soon, um, next week, in, in fact. Um, and you just recently returned from Vegas, which we will discuss. I will talk more about my documentary um, that we are working to finalize. I should have a final cut of it this weekend, today, in fact. Um, and I'll kind of get into how to sell and promote a documentary and you will be discussing your app discipline Mm -hmm. and that'll be interesting. I'm going to grill you on that. So get ready for, uh, some Cronkite level questions. I woke up ready, baby. You you did. You did. Um, (laughs) already worked out twice today. It's only like two o'clock. And then when we, and then we will be discussing essentially the broader topic of how to motivate when you're not feeling up to the task and little tricks of the trade that we have found over the years being the old age of, you know, early thirties, um, <laughs> that we think could help you for sure. Oh yeah. Dude, let's dive in. So what have you been up to recently? Well, I recently just went to Vegas to visit our pal, our buddy Morton, as he uh, played his one of his uh, shows at his residency at Encore. Um, a lot of fun, dude. It was good to see Morton. I haven't seen him in a little bit, and he's been you know traveling all over the place, touring. He's he was talking about being burnt out for uh, just. I think he said he slept like a few hours in sixteen days, like each night, and just was grinding, working, 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 flying all over the place. He literally just flew. 24 hours to get to Vegas. And, and in the morning, we went to bed five or six in the morning. Uh, after his show, we stayed out and kind of we were just catching up and having fun. Um, at seven o'clock in the morning, he got on a flight and flew to Ibiza. So um, that man travels. Yeah, yeah. Uh, one of the executive producers or the executive producer from the, one of the films I did uh, not too long ago, well, I invited him out. So we got to hang, catch up and uh, hang out with his son and, and his friend. Um, and there, I brought them backstage. They had a great time. They're still there now, uh, enjoying Vegas. And it was just cool, man. Morton's such a nice guy, you know, he's, he's such a great friend. And, and I was telling him, cause we kind of briefly talked about it before I, before I uh, headed out on the trip was I was telling him how me and you were talking about this, but how, when I first met Morton, I was sleeping on somebody's couch. I had just been robbed and left homeless. And then finally I, f- I found a buddy in a studio apartment who had a couch I could sleep on and it was too small and it was very uncomfortable. Oh, man. Um, I had no money. I couldn't book a job to save my life. Um, and he wasn't doing so well <laughs> over here either. And he was renting a room from a friend in downtown Los Angeles, um, trying to figure out his path in LA, right? And trying to figure out what his sound was, what kind of music he wanted to put out. He was always trying different stuff over the years, which I think you have to do as a, not only as a creator, but uh, in such a competitive space, such as DJing, um, because you don't know what's going to hit. And it's kind of like sure. movie, movies too. You don't, like an actor can go make a movie, a producer can go make a movie. You don't know if it's going to hit or not, but if it does, sometimes it catches wildfire. There's plenty of examples of even indie films doing that, right? Yeah, and like, you know, 
going from a horror film to a documentary even i'll kind of touch on that later for sure like yeah. trying out different stuff yeah and then and, and but it's exploring that too and also creating and developing projects sometimes as they come along right but yeah no i mean there's there's been you know i never thought i'd be doing as many comedies as i as i have uh in because I, I, I always want to do drama I, like i love drama that's my favorite genre really in action um but yeah, it's been so much fun and it's been exciting meeting, working with so many great, talented people. Uh, but back to Morton, you know, now he's touring the world, one of the top DJs in the world, um, partnering with David Guetta. They've got Future Rave together. And just to see him uh, just crushing it, dude, is like, especially knowing, you know, how much work he's put in every single day, literally to get to where he's at now. It's like, dude, you did it. You're doing it, you know? And nothing's more fulfilling for me as a friend that I've, not only been an advocate for his success, but also supported him as much as I could along the way. Um, like even when he first came out, I was blowing up on the internet and I started doing, doing well out and uh, started getting booking jobs in Hollywood, you know, and kind of getting that going. And I would post him and shout him out just to get him more notoriety and do like almost meet and greets at his events just to get more people there. And it's just because I love him. You know, he's one of, my, one of my best friends and I would do that for any one of my good friends, right? Because um, you want to see people win that you care about and uh, that you love. And Morton's that guy, you know, he's transformed as a human and only become nicer, more talented, you know, uh, more successful and he deserves every second of it. So it was just, it was just good to risk my lower back driving <laughs> from LA to Vegas and back in 24 hours. In um, the heat too. Oh, it's hot. It is hot. I, uh, that is a recommendation for everybody who goes to Vegas during the summer, bring some kind of flip-flops or slippers or something if you're going to the pool because I walked about 11 feet from my chair to the water and I pretty sure I have a blister on my foot from those couple steps crazy um but but it was nice I mean I got I got a little little ton a little sun and a, a little ton of sun in like 20 minutes so it worked out and then uh yeah man that, that was that was Vegas you know it was a good time yeah it is crazy to think about how far you guys have come for sure um you know, since your 20s. Um, absolutely. It's crazy yeah. to think about. Yeah, it is wild. Uh, and then, yeah, there's just the evolution too, right? Like I'm nowhere near where I want to be in my career, um, but I'm so grateful to be where I am right now, you know? Which is, a, it's a funny like juxtaposition because it's like I just have to settle into enjoying the journey, whatever that looks like, uh, and, and knowing I'm just, I'm just where I'm supposed to be, you know? Dude, I would absolutely say the same exact thing, you know? Yeah. Um, I have one feature film under my belt, you know, about to be two and then, you know, lining up three, hopefully. But, like, it's essentially recognizing where you are and being appreciative, like you said, but then also planning to have a bigger, better future as well. Yeah. And it's how do you balance that? It, it, it's interesting. Yeah. And it's, it's, you know, what are you sacrificing to get to that point, right? Like how much time do you have to allocate to the dream? And if you really are invested in it, you got to do it all the time. You know, you got to lose sleep over it and you got to stay up late nights, sometimes get up early, sometimes all nighters. I never pulled more on all nighters in my life than I have in the last, you know, two years really, just because you got to get stuff done. Dude, me too, actually. Yeah. It's, it's a weird, because like I grew up just in love with sleep. <laughs> in love with it dude like I was my favorite thing to do because I could lose a dream and I could yeah. you know I just enjoyed being there in a dream state more than I did life which is almost sad but I did have depression so that was part of it <laughs> but um but being able to explore in that world in those worlds in my subconscious and whatever it is is like dude it's it was you could create in whatever way you wanted to like I dude I remember during uh the middle of the pandemic I watched some old like from start to finish, long series, you know, Friends was one of them, uh, Smallville was one of them because I loved it when I was younger. Um, and literally two to three times a week, I would dream that I was Superman so I could just fly around in my dreams and be yeah. super strong and like super hearing and go save people and do all kinds of stuff. So it was like, for me, you know, that feeling of flying is like, there's nothing better, dude. And as someone who used to be afraid of heights as a kid too, it's like, it's even crazier. And it makes sense too that you're in a creative industry, which is essentially drawing from the subconscious and manifesting it in the real world, um, you know, through art and expression. Yeah. Yeah. And that's something that's important to me too, is I've always loved art since I was young, you know, and I think a lot of yeah. people look at me as like, you know, 
what sport did you play? You're obviously an athletic big person. What sport did you play? I didn't get to play sports. I got to paint and draw and skateboard and surf and, you know, like do all the things that were kind of more singular, uh, but, but that I loved. And then it turned into, you know, I guess kind of bodybuilding. I'm not a bodybuilder exactly, but I do build my body. Um, but that was art to me, you know, it's like Arnold explained it as like a, a sculptor sculpting, right? It just takes more time and you have to be very attentive to details and understanding your body and the nutrition and all that stuff. Um, and then it turned into acting, you know? So it's just been a one, one, it's always been art, you know? Yeah. Fuck yeah. So that's a little catch up on what I have been up to uh, in the past couple of days. But um, what have you been up to, Will? Thanks for asking. <laughs> um, no, yeah, absolutely. I Unfortunately, I missed a big trip this summer because I, I got like a, I, I guess it was the flu. It wasn't COVID, but it was, it was really bad. And I was really bummed because I missed a big family trip I wanted to do. Um, however, um, I recently have, I saw Oppenheimer. And, I, and I'm not going to go into like a full review here, but like I, I did want to talk about it a little bit and just kind of say that, you know, Christopher Nolan has an incredi- incredible body of work. Um, but I definitely think this one was way too long and um, pretty anticlimactic, honestly. Mm. Um, you know, Look, the performances were amazing. And like Robert Downey Jr., um, was it Killian Murphy? Is yeah, that? Killian Murphy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love him. Peaky Blinders is great. He's dope. Um, but I, I just left the theater dissatisfied and thinking it was too long. Um, dissatisfied is the wrong word, it, especially with everything else coming out today. I thought it was, it was a good film. It, it was. It was an above average good film. Um, but like still could have been, and not, not like 30 minutes shorter, like an hour shorter, mm. um, which is like crazy to me to think about when you're sitting there watching a film. Um, but yeah, so I, I'm not going to give up too much about the film for those who haven't seen it out there, but that was just my, my quick take. The other th- yeah. Sorry, I was gonna say just, just for reference for anybody. Cause like, I actually didn't even know what Oppenheimer was when I started seeing it go viral everywhere. Obviously, I looked into it, but just a brief overview of what Oppenheimer is about, like a little... Yeah, yeah. Oppenheimer is about the scientist Oppenheimer, or physicist, whatever he is, um, who essentially worked with Albert Einstein to create the atomic bomb. Um, Very, very heavy subject matter. And I do think they dealt with that very delicately. And um, they showed like the pain and torture that it would cause any human to create such a weapon of mass destruction and, Mm. and, um, evil. So like there are many, many good qualities of the film. Um, I just was a little bit let down and, and, uh, thought it went on too long, but yeah. Um, story of the atomic bomb, very, not very uplifting. Mm. Um, but the other things I've been up to, have been heavily involved in the comic book, Kane, that and McKenna and all the others we have. However, Kane 4 is coming out, as we mentioned earlier. And, um, you know, I've really, since I began writing at the beginning of the pandemic, um, I have found that, like, not only have I objectively become a better writer, and I'm not saying I'm some amazing writer. I'm just saying I'm progressing and I'm better than I was before, obviously. And I'll go back at scripts and, you know, I think rewriting is the most important process of writing. And that was kind of a big hurdle for me early on was I wouldn't go back to things. I'd finish it and then I'd be like, okay, it's done. It's like, no, dude, you got, you got to go back and break that thing down and um, really look at it. Um, through a totally different lens. And like that was one of the most important steps for any aspiring writers out there. I would say the most important thing is to go back. And, um, And also like the way I approach the outlining process and how I set everything up. Like I have whiteboards all over the house and I write out characters, location, setting, themes. Like 
if you can outline something, then you can picture it in your head before you even go to write. Like there is tons of work to be done before you even go to write a script or a comic, whatever it is. And even for um, a screenplay that I'm working on, just waiting for the writer's strike to be over, essentially, um, there's, I think, a 30-page beat sheet of every beat in the film that is worked through. So you have this guiding light and this guide while you are sitting there writing. Um, and yeah, I think the, the pre-writing phase and then the post-writing phase of going back and editing it and rewriting, um, that's what I've found I've improved on the most and like worked on the most to really get my writing to a better place. I like that. There's a book that I read years ago and I took rigorous notes. Um, Probably every second page had a post-it note on it uh, with a note of something that I really enjoyed out of the book. But it was called "How to Write a, a Was It Yeah How to Write a Script in Twenty One Days." Um, and one of the main points when writing a script for for you know this quick style writing to have a finished product right was write the first draft as fast as humanly possible. Like don't spend time you know and and, and yeah beat it out right but um, don't spend time thinking about it. Just get it on paper, get it done. And then right. you start to go back and revise and, and change it and add things and you know fix the, the format and all that stuff. But that was their advice. And every, everyone has their own um, you know, structured how do they write, right? But that's what's been working for you. And it sounds, you know, I've seen no. it firsthand. It's been great to see how fast that you can get things done, right? No, I wouldn't say that's my process though. Absolutely not. What do you mean? Like I'm not, speed. Not saying, speed. Like no, I'm not saying what I just said. I said you just explained your process. Yeah, yes, yes, yeah, yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. But I would say there is merit to that point of yeah. don't get too caught up on your first draft, right? Yeah. And I think that would be my biggest takeaway of that would be like, absolutely, don't begin rewriting while you're writing the first draft. Yeah. Essentially, like, like get it out for sure. Yeah, absolutely. There is there is a writer. I, <laughs> I kind of want to look it up. Spencer, can you look this up? Who, who said this? Um, I'm sure a lot of people have said this, but, you know, the first draft of anything is shit. Like that's, I, think, I don't know if it was Aaron Sorkin or anything like that, but there was somebody out there that said that. And it, like, I always, I always think about that because I'm like, you know, it's great to conceptualize uh, an idea and get it on paper, but, you know, with anything creative, especially in the film and TV space, you, you know, as, as a producer and being on multiple different sets, from the conception of the idea to the however many drafts that script is to however many changes are made by the director or the actors or writers along the way, pivots with weather and everything else, it's never that first draft conception perfectly uh, you know, conceived on film. It, there has a million different things, so it's about a matter of like finding that and discovering that and collaborating with people to get to that last final product and hopefully it's better than it was ever intended to be in the beginning, right? Yeah, just the nature of a draft, right? Absolutely. You want to... Did you find anything? I did, yes. Uh, Ernest Hemingway said that. Ernest Hemingway, even better. There you go. Even, I mean, Aaron Sorkin, you're a legend, but also Ernest Hemingway is a legend. You know? <laughs> Hemingway's a badass. Yeah. So, two great writers. <laughs> two great writers. <laughs> on the subject of writing, uh, you've been working hard on Kane and McKenna and everything too. Is there anything coming up with Kane that you can share with us right now? Um, well, yeah, the, the release of Kane 4, um, as I was saying earlier, um, we're really excited for this one. It basically, it expands the story a bit. We're going to go down into like South America. He's going to go, I'm not going to ruin much, but like he essentially will be tested like he's never been tested before. And, um, we're really excited to get this one out there. And uh, yeah, get feedback. How far along, for those that don't know, is issue number four out of the whole series? There are six issues total. So we're about two thirds of the way. Nice. Yeah. How crucial is number four to the storyline? Um, it, it's actually very crucial because he, he's going to receive something here and um, he'll be face to face with his first God. He'll meet a God for the first time and he may or may not receive something from that God. Um, 
that will be very vital to the story. Nice. Was there, you mentioned rewriting with, uh, in your writing process. Um, was there any rewriting you did for Kane Ford? Um, oh dude, absolutely. So I wrote the first volume during COVID. Um, and every script before I send it out to the artist, I will go back and almost rewrite completely. Um, because I'm, and I encourage everyone out there to do that because you will be a better writer further along and you will look back at things and be like, how the, what was I thinking when I wrote that? Um, and then you just go back and polish it up and you know, you'll have new techniques, you'll have new formatting, um, strategies and all these different things and, and, and a different idea of your story and the characters and what you want to tell and what you want to say and the messaging. So like always go back for sure. Yeah. I, I know this just because of the conception that, you know, we've worked on for the past like year and a half basically, but, um, was your writing when you submitted four and obviously five and six, you know, that are coming up as well. Has it, have you added or changed anything that are crucial to the overarching story of Kane because of the, the growth that it's had since the initial, you know, launch period? Yeah, that's a really good question. The, um, the entire ending of five and beginning of six is completely additional and almost my favorite part of the entire volume mm. is the end of issue five, beginning of issue six, like big cliffhanger and, um, tons of context that will really show the readers how big and expansive this universe is and, and this story is. Um, but yeah, no, man. Just to touch on that too, you know, um, part of my job as an actor is to break down a script, you know, to find, you know, the intention behind everything to see if the story makes sense. Like I have to break down dialogue, see if, if I can add value there or, you know, there's just so much that goes into really breaking down a script and the story, you know, and sometimes the overarching uh, themes that go along with that. When I first read, you know, and we've been working on this for a while, but when you wrote, you know, all the issues, I'd, I'd read, written them already, or not written, I'd had read them already. Um, but when you went back and rewrote six, and I read that for the first time, just a testament to, to Will's writing and the progression that he's had over the last year and a half, um, I legitimately cried reading issue six, you know, the first, the draft that, the, the new draft that you had had. Uh, created um, because it was like conceptualized not only with Kane's story and where he was at and what was going on in, the, in that uh, issue specifically for me, um, but the way that it was written, you know, and, and the depth that it had comparatively, it, it was, it was so strong. It's so compelling. Uh, there's, there's so many emotions that, that arise because you're it's, too kind. I'm not, I'm, but I'm not you're making I, me blush. No, I'm being honest though. Like it's, that's a true moment that happened for me where I was like, this not only is great story, but this is great writing. It moved me, you know, and I have this friend. Thank you, bro. Of course, bro. I'm, you gotta give credit where credit's due. And I have a friend who, you know, he, has worked with some of the biggest studios in the world. And, you know, he's, he worked on Toy Story, worked on a bunch of different projects where he goes back and he uh, basically, not only does he write scripts uh, and, and incredible films as well, but he goes and breaks down, like he's a script doctor, right? He'll go and break them down. And he said that he'll write a script. And when he gives it to his wife, if she doesn't cry, he tears it up and starts over again. You know, and that's everything for him. And right. so, so just to point to that of what you just did, like it actually moved me and that moment one major moment that happens to that specifically in this journey this this unveiling of of kane's journey if i could say that um it was very powerful so it was really cool to see thank you bro i appreciate that a lot yeah. we're we're doing we're doing big things here and this is uh just the beginning of what we're gonna get out with this franchise yeah um speaking of moving tell me about your new app that you've been working on discipline Mm, we'll get you moving. Yeah, the Discipline Fit app. Uh, this is something, honestly, that I have wanted to do for, I don't know, seven, eight years now. 
and I've attempted to do, I can't even tell you how many times. Multiple companies I've worked with started off originally as a website. Um, I invested a lot of money and got, you know, screwed over. Uh, and that happened a few times because uh, it is a, it's very, like, to be fully transparent with anybody that wants to dive into an app or even websites, which are much simpler, very much less complex than, than an app altogether. Sure. Um, the people developing them, there is, I can say, I think not all the time, not everybody, but across the board, it's a very high likely chance that they will take advantage of it or not be able to complete the process or over promise and under deliver. Um, and that becomes very financially, uh, not, not, not the best, you know, <laughs> <laughs> for if you're investing and they don't follow through. So, uh, that and a startup and, you know, multiple other projects, companies that have wanted to partner with me over the years. And it just like, I didn't want to be, you know, a cog in the machine. I wanted to truly help people and I wanted to be able to do it on my own scale and on my own right and, and discipline for me. Even when I first started the process of this app, I had a different name for it. You know, it was going to be, I, I couldn't find the name. I couldn't find the name. Uh, so it was just going to be the Brock O'Hearn Fit app, which there's nothing wrong with that because, yeah, you know, standard. Yeah, I built a brand over the past 10 years and, you know, people know that I, <laughs> I like to work out, you know, and I, I've studied this You're for You're not years. fit, bro. What are you talking <laughs> I'm about? I'm working on it every day. And it was just one of these things where like I actually ended up because this is what happens, you know, over time, everyone gets an injury at some point. I ended up getting an injury earlier at the beginning, yeah, the beginning of the year, uh, at the end of December, beginning of January, I can't remember the exact date, but I tore my meniscus. Well, instead of launching in January or February, like I was intending to originally, um, I had to tend to this injury. Yeah. And I didn't want to get surgery because uh, I didn't want to be out for so long in case any projects or, or I booked anything. And so you were powering, powering through that thing too, man. That was crazy. Yeah. And it, yeah. And it, it like, it really hurt me because it was a pre existing injury from before that, you know, I did stem cell and I did all of this different therapy, uh, physical therapy that I, I, you know, I worked with a, a very talented, successful guy um, in, this, in the knee space, uh, knees over toes been. And, um, I thought I was really progressing, you know, and then I found out January, uh, I tore it again, the other one. Um, and it's one of those things that you really got to take care with proper nutrition, which, which I was doing, but you got to take care with, you know, the strengthening and lengthening of these tendons and ligaments. And, uh, there's different micro movements and, and different movements that you can do all together to strengthen all of those those areas that sometimes are skipped if you're just trying to build muscle, right? You, we tend to focus on the bigger things. And so it helped me reinvent myself in a way that I didn't have to go get surgery. I've been doing physical therapy for a long time. My legs are getting great, you know, and I'm super healthy. I can run, I can jump rope, I can have fun, I can bike, I can do all this stuff. I can squat, you know, which I wasn't able to do at all. I could barely walk at the beginning of the year. But through that whole process, the whole point of me telling this whole story is it started off as a Brock O'Hearn Fit app, and it has now changed to discipline because what I found throughout this entire process, more than anything, the foundation, the core of why we do what we do in almost everything is our discipline. That's the difference between us being successful and not at it, right? And when it comes to fitness specifically, you know, what you put in and how disciplined, you can have willpower all day, but eventually it'll crack. You know, there's this great book that I read and I love, um, because before I was like, I can just will through it. I can power through it. I can power through it. I can do this. I can do this. There's a, a book called Willpower Doesn't Work. And I love that because it, it puts in perspective. Well, it's like, well, it's discipline. It's our habits. It's how we show up. You know, getting up in the morning and immediately doing fasted cardio or immediately making my, you know, healthy meal instead of, you know, eating donuts or pancakes or whatever it may be. Um, that's part of my discipline, sticking to my macro nutrient uh, based diet to reach my goals and then hit my training program correctly, do the cardio I need to do, put in, put in that time, that work, the effort, the energy it takes, because it takes a lot to get in a high level of, of shape. That's discipline. And so what happened is I found that word and it, it just, it, it rung me. And then I found every other person that ever speaks highly on a high level is talking about discipline and how important it is. And I of was course. just amazed that this wasn't taken you know, that somebody else hasn't developed out a massive app in, in, in that space already with that name. Um, so I created the, the company and, you know, uh, I'm excited to just help people. The whole point of me doing this is to help. So I have some questions. Shoot, shoot or shoot. Speaking of like developers and that whole world, how did you, like if, you, if I'm out there and I want to start an app, 
How did you find developers? And then what was that process like? Yeah. So before this, I was a part of a startup that, you know, during COVID, we, all of our stuff, essentially about 90% of it was gym centric and all of the, the gyms had shut down. So it put a major rut in our schedule and our timing and our uh, resources, everything that we did put in, we had to re, you know, uh, uh, visit it and kind of change our path. Well, it ended up, the company ended up, you know, being put on a hiatus because of all of this, because it put us in such a hole. And <clears throat> through that process, you know, we were developing an app. I was working with many different app developers. One of my best friends, Shane, who he is an app developer, um, because he wanted to make an app, he hired these guys and, you know, they charged him about 30 grand and didn't get him anywhere near or close to where he wanted to be. Basically ripped him off. I've had that happen multiple times, uh, unfortunately, but it's a great learning process. So it's an investment in, you know, that base. So you kind of have to be careful with developers, right? You say, we want this deliverable over yeah. this amount of time for this budget. Yeah. You can, you got to be careful on timing and like yeah. all that, right? Yeah, exactly. And you have to do your due diligence with who you're working with because, you know, if they have created a product and, and that, you know, um, that works and emulates and it emulates what you want to do, then you know you're in at least decent hands. Um, it comes down to, you know, team management. You know, you're the, you're the head of the snake. You're the head of the, the company. And so you have to be able to communicate properly with people what your vision is, be clear and concise with that as well, much like comic books, to be honest, much like almost any company, I think. Um, or the communicate, like, design specs with yeah. expectations. and Yeah, exactly. yeah. And, and so what I found was I had asked and I'd had meeting after meeting after meeting after meeting with different people in the space, um, different companies. I'd seen what they had done as well. Um, I had been, I had had, you know, my, my go at it for about six, seven years in different ways, whether that is in the website or app space and, um, all the things I've been, you know, approached by and offered by other big, large companies to do the, the same thing in the same space, but it no, none of them really they didn't have what I needed, what I wanted, you know, what I wanted to, what I knew worked for me and I knew, and I know is going to work for other people. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have the ability to get that across. So what I did is I went and found the correct team, did my due diligence. It took months and months of research and effort and reaching out and meetings. And finally I found the right team. Um, we've developed something very special. It's, it's coming very, very soon. It's almost finished. Um, but it does everything I needed to do. You know, and, and that's my whole point is like, how can I scale this to help on the biggest, you know, way possible? And what's your plan to bring it to market? I'm going to start with just organic marketing, you know, um, with my social media platform and reach as many people as I can organically there. Uh, and be then, on the app store. It'll be on the app store. It'll be in all the app stores. Yep. Um, and then, uh, I want to do some I don't know if affiliate marketing would be the correct, but I want to partner with the correct uh, or ambassador, know, ambassador program. program. Or something, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, um, but affiliate then, too, like they both. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, a, it's a mixture of both because they'll, you know, whoever I partner with will make money as well. Um, right. Or I can just hire out trainers as well uh, directly to create more platforms within because I can have an unlimited amount of platforms within my uh, or programs. I mean, within my platform, and kind of just keep it growing that way, and then get into paid and. Uh, um, paid ads and kind of keep that going. But, but it's just a matter of like navigating what the user is going to want and what they need and what their needs are. So I created, you know, essentially two, two programs, uh, multiple different levels in each program, but one is an at home for any type of person. If you want to get a quick workout, there's some workouts that are five minutes, some are 35, some are a little bit more or less in between, you know, but what it does is I created it to where if you have an injury, you know, a knee injury, a shoulder injury, whatever, I have modified versions for you. And, and that goes across the board for your entire body because these will be full body um, or hyper-focused on different areas. But the, the split between it, it's just to get you the best results, you know, uh, low intensity, or it can be high intensity, but it's uh, uh, not hard on your body. Right. Um, so that's going to be good for anybody because if you are super fit and you want to have an intense workout, but you have a shoulder injury, so that's your limit, well, you can take the easier shoulder part of the workout, make, make that part easier for you, but the rest of it can still be intense, right? So you'll have like a range of workouts that are specific to different body parts and stuff like that. Yeah, and, and, and essentially it's like a, a hit cardio, full functional training program from beginner to intermediate to expert or advanced. Right. Um, and each one of those has their own modified versions within it. So there's that part. So, you know, if, if a 80 year old woman wants to start working out, 
this is a safe way for her to go do it. Yeah, sure. Know? And anything in between, you know, uh, like I do the workouts. So I just, I know that they're great. I've tested everything. And then the other art part is uh, if you want to, you know, essentially bodybuild or sculpt your body, I've created a program for that too. So for men and Damn, women. you literally like anyone that wants to get into working out, yeah. there's something for them. Yeah. And that's more of a gym centric uh, base plan, but it, it's the proper formula. It's got the nutrition, yeah. um, you know, but you can take, it, you, it'll track all your macros. It'll get you in there. It'll get you, get you going, create a shopping list, a grocery list for you to, when you go to the grocery store and you can get all your, your food nutrition, if you're not doing a meal plan service, something like that, which hopefully maybe one day I'll be partnering with someone who can add more value to people's uh, uh, lives to help them get the results. But the whole thing is, you know, uh, creating a discipline, you know, and, and making that promise to yourself because you deserve it and getting it out to people and, and seeing what we can do. My whole thing is that I know what fitness and health has done for me and how it's changed my life. It's changed, it's changed my physical, it's changed my, my surround, like everything in my reality. It's changed my mental health. Um, I've never found a negative effect from, from health and fitness. So I know that no matter what your occupation is, what your goals are, whatever it is, it only adds value. It takes work. Yeah. It takes discipline. It takes, you know, constant, um, constantly uh, checking yourself and, and making sure you have the right habits. And, you know, we slip up and we make mistakes every now and again, but it's that little reminder, you know, to just be the best version of yourself, you know? So that's, yeah. that's why I, that's why I made it. That was kind of a long spiel, but you know, that's exciting, man. Yeah. And then when can we expect it out? Um, I'm going to do it. Uh, mid August is going to be the launch. I don't have a set date just yet. Cause mid -August, sure everything's coming up. Yeah. Coming up a couple soon. weeks away. Yep. Yep. Hell yeah. I might do it on my birthday just as a gift to myself. Oh, that'd be cool. <laughs> yeah. I want to know why you chose to do a documentary as your next film. Great question. Back to you, Chuck. Um, let's see why I chose to do. I think like a lot of things in life, it was uh, circumstantial and um, reflect, a reflection of um, the people around me and where I was in my life, for sure. I think when you see an opportunity, this goes with any business or industry for whatever, if you see an opportunity around you, you should seize it. And there was a, there was a great idea um, that I had in my head. And when I went to the person, I was like, look, you should probably do this. And they were like, yeah, I'll think about it. Um, you know, doesn't sound too bad. And honestly, I had a very similar idea for a different person um, about six months before beginning the process. And that person who's, you know, very famous, has a lot going on, et cetera, we got, I wouldn't say we got along far in the process, but we had discussed it. And for whatever reason, it fell through. It, it was a little, it was definitely like a controversial topic um, at the time. So like, I understood why they didn't want to do it. Um, but I had literally just before that had an idea for a documentary and, um, I've been interested in them forever. Like I took a class at USC about documentary film going all the way back to like the first one ever in like, you know, Northern Canada or something with like, uh, Nanook of the North, I think it's called, um, documentary now that show with Fred Armisen did like a really, really funny spoof on it. Um, but documentaries started with the Lumiere brothers in France in the 1800s, and they created one of the first cameras. Thomas Edison had done one in America, Lumiere brothers in France, and they would essentially just film like a street corner or a zoo, like a lion, and like they called them actualities, like mm. actualities. Um, and like it was essentially just capturing real life, and that was the closest thing possible to like cinema veritas which is ver veritas in french that means truth so yeah. like tr cinema of truth um where you're just capturing something and showing it but then the concept of the auteur like the author ca came into the picture of like if we're showing a series of images the voice the opinion of the director will always shine through what do you show? What do you not show? Who do you show talking? What do they say? What is their opinion? What do you include in the final cut? What do you cut from the final cut? And you can't make a film without 
a voice or a vision. Mm. There is no true, 100% true, like, cinema veritas when it comes to documentaries. You can be as not unbiased as you want. It's still going to come through because you have to have a vision. You have to have a goal. You have to have that. However, you know, sometimes you can just really, truly try to document something and, and show what you're trying to do. So for this, it was really... What is the voice? What is the opinion? What is the goal? Um, how do we kind of nail that? And I think when you're doing a documentary on a person and kind of like a year in the life of, um, it's a lot easier to be like unbiased because you're really just covering the events of their life in a year. However, you know, in order to keep the audience engaged and make it an interesting film, you need to show conflict, overcoming adversity, um, and all that type of stuff as well to just, you know, keep it interesting and be real. You don't, you're not going to hide an issue that they came across just to like make them appear better than they are or whatever. Um, and that was something the subject of the documentary was very keen on is like, this isn't going to be an idealized version of myself. This is going to be the real events of what happened as, or as, as close as uh, possible. Um, but yeah, to answer the original question, like I had weirdly already planned on doing a documentary with someone else and, um, then realized, wow, this could actually be a great opportunity with this person. Um, And, you know, luckily enough, they agreed to do it. And, you know, we're two years in and looking at a final cut. Um, And, you know, we could have, does it need to take two years? No, not really. But you want to get as much in there as possible in their life. And you're pretty much at the mercy of real life, right? Like what is actually happening. Um, And we wanted to be as true to that as possible. So it just takes time. Um, and then in the editing process, obviously, like trying to make sure we include and cut everything we need to. But um, yeah, I've always had a very passionate uh, stance on documentaries. I, mm. I love them. And like, you know, whether it's Amy or, um, you know, I'm forgetting the name. The one the movie Rush was based on um, about the two race car drivers. Ford was Ferrari. No, it's no, it's right, right. Um, one of the actual guys. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's yeah. another like car movie that's based off real things. Yeah, yeah. Um, Spence, what's it called again? Is it a uh, Hunt versus Lauda, F1's greatest racing rivals TV movie from 2013? No. Um, we'll figure it out. But um, uh, Free Solo, bro. That Free yeah. Solo is one of the most crowning achievements in human history. Like that's. I knew it would win the Oscar only because, not only, it's a big deal, but like strictly because it was like this crowning achievement of humanity. Like to climb that freaking mountain in Yosemite, like was it Half Dome? Mm-hmm. Like without fucking ropes and whatever. Like documentaries bring you into these worlds and like really give you a glimpse of these extraordinary people. Um, and, and, you know, places in time, like moments in time. Um, and I think that's like why I love them so much is you can really get these amazing glimpses into people's lives and moments in time and achievements. Yeah. That's awesome. Uh, I'm curious since you guys are, you know, essentially looking at a final cut, right? Um, knowing that you want to do this since you were younger, Right, and you you went to USC film school. You know you you were editing your family's vacation trips on on iMovie since when you were young. Um, how does it feel knowing you're about to lock in your first documentary, um, but another film in in a position that you've always wanted to be in? Man, that's a good question. Um, how does it feel, honestly? It's funny, right, in life, and you know this, like when you are working so hard on something for years, right, like you kind of have tunnel vision. You're kind of just like, okay, what's the next step? Okay, how can I improve it? 
okay, what can I do today to improve this and move it along? And you kind of lose that like overall astonishment of like, wow, this is actually my dream that I'm moving to achieve, right? Mm -hmm. Um, So I guess, yeah, I mean, I guess I never lose the gratitude of of, uh, collaborating with the people that it's about and with. Um, That gratitude is always there. Um, But it's really just losing myself in the work enough where, um, you know, you don't really have time to think about the bigger picture. But I guess I won't have that moment, I don't think, until it's done, it's out, um, we get feedback, and, like, it's really further along, I think. Because like, until then, it's like, you know, un- get, yeah. Until it's received by people too, right? And- received um, out there in the world, yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And that makes total sense because, you know, you're still in the process, right? Totally. For anybody out there that's a filmmaker and uh, wants to create a film and then, you know, that's its own process in and of itself, but there's a whole other element when it comes to distribution. Like how do you approach finding a distributor or um, what do you look for or hope for in a distributor when you're going to market with a product like a film? Totally. Great question too. So I think honestly to go even further back, I would say if there's a good idea for a film, don't be afraid to talk about it, pitch it, work on it and try to manifest it into reality because you never know who will say yes and what you can do unless you go out there and try to do it. And um, it's really, really hard to say no to a good idea. I don't care who you are, like James Cameron has trouble saying no to a good idea. Um, So first I'd say that. And then secondly, I'd say, depending on the project, um, you know, like for the resort, our horror film, we partnered with Vertical Entertainment, who we love, and that was a great fit for an indie horror film. Um, This project being a documentary, which is totally different genre of film, um, and essentially on a little bit larger of a scale, it, we're going to definitely have to maneuver to partner with the right person on this because this is going to be, um, we're going to have a very big launch for this and finding the right partner is going to be critical. But finding the right distributor for a film, if you're out there to answer the question, um, you really have to look at what genre of film is it, what format of film is it, um, what's the scale of the film? Is it a $80 million film? Is it a $5 million film? All of those factors will go into who you partner with to distribute um, and never stop looking. There is someone out there that wants to buy your movie from you and show it. Um, and even if it's not that, you can always put it on YouTube and market it that way and just go super, you know, um, super guerrilla style with it. Um, there's always a way to get something seen and shown and distributed, especially nowadays. Yeah. Like you just mentioned vertical, it was a great fit for the resort because it's an indie horror film and they almost specialize in, in that kind of category, right? Yes. So you indie can, film. Yeah. And, and indie film. Exactly. And then you said also like, you know, is it a $80 million film or is it a $5 million film or what is your film? The scale of it too. That's the difference between potentially if you're not already working with a big studio, getting in with a big studio, right? Yeah. Or, or a network or, you know, streaming platform, whatever it may be. But like you said, there is no, all you gotta do is make the film. You gotta go, whatever that vision is, whatever that film that you, you see and you want to make and you're invested in, go make it. And then there will be a home for it. It's, it's nice. I think if you already have that set up initially or you have that partnership or, or you're producing with those people um, to get it to market in their space, right? Like it would be great to make a show with HBO and they're producing it and then you know it's going to live on HBO, right? But that's not always the case as an independent filmmaker. Yeah, and like look at Sound of Freedom. Like literally yeah. a film that just came out that was tossed away by one major studio and then they went out and found Angel Studios, which is a fantastic studio to be a part of and and work with um like they didn't give up Mm. they had a film that got thrown in the trash and now it's 
literally making more than Indiana Jones, Mission Impossible, like the list goes on. It, it's a $14 million budget yeah. making over a hundred million. Yep. Um, and it, like, that's a perfect example of never give up on your distribution because yeah. you can find a home. And that took them on that, on that point too, I believe it took them four years to get from being thrown away essentially, you know, to right. getting distribution, getting in theaters. Exactly. Yeah. So they never quit on it cause they believed in it, you know, and it is, and it, is a powerful, powerful message that I think needs to be heard and seen and supported. Hundred um, percent. Yeah. But yeah, thanks for uh, diving into documentaries with me. I appreciate that. Yeah. Thanks for the the information. It was highly entertaining for myself. Um, so, as one thing we touched on earlier in the introduction period of this program, um, what are some ways when you are tired or not feeling up to the task that you kind of force yourself? to become motivated and work when you otherwise don't feel like it? Um, I think it's kind of funny because it really does circle back to what I was talking about with my app. It's discipline for me. You know, it's, it's so easy to like hit the snooze button and, you know, have a cheat meal to not, you know, send that email when I'm supposed to send it. Like if it's a work thing, there's a million ways to kind of self-sabotage ourselves. If, but if we have goals, it really comes down to what your why is. Like, why am I doing this? Why do I wake up in the morning? You know, like, and, and for me, the reason, just as an example uh, with my app, the reason I work so hard at it and I, and I want to do it is because I actually genuinely, because it helped change my life, I want to give that gift of health and fitness and mental health as much as I possibly can to people. So it's not about me anymore, you know? It's not about, okay, what do I want? What am I trying to take? Or what am I trying to get out of this? What's this? It's like, what can I give? And I wanna give it on the highest scale possible. So if I wanna sleep in or I wanna miss a workout or, you know, those those, those little voices come in your head at, in, in random hours, you know? And it's like, okay, well, there's, you know, six cakes in front of me and I wanna have all six of them, but how do I not have any of them? And I drink my glass of water and, you know, and chug a protein shake, you know? It's your why. It's it's why you're doing what you're doing, and it has to be more powerful than the reason not to do it. And it's the whole. Uh, I was having this conversation with a friend of mine the other day, uh, and he he's in his mid forties, uh, and he's you know worth tens of millions of dollars. He's been you know very successful, and he had never heard it conceptualized like this. It, it's pain versus pleasure, right? We either choose a temporary pain that leads to long term pleasure. That's you know, waking up and doing the cardio, that's, you know, temporary pain of going to the gym when you don't want to, or even going at all. Uh, the temporary pain of choosing the chicken breast versus the cookie, you know, and then you have long-term pleasure of you're reaching your goals and it's over time gets you where you want to go. But then the opposite would be the temporary pleasure, which is what we innately go for, right? It's in, it's, it's an instinct thing. I think more than anything, it's in our DNA. So you have to consciously, a lot of times think about what you're doing. Temporary pleasure is like, Oh, I want to eat that donut. I want to feel good right now. Yep. You know, I want to get that that rush, sugar rush. I want to. And, get a, and you literally only feel good for like the five seconds you're chewing, and yeah. then boom, bad. T it, the temporary pleasure, exactly. So it lasts for a very short amount of time, and then you have long term pain, which is I just sabotage myself in the goals that I want to reach. If your goals are fitness, right? Um, but it's right. the same thing when it comes to work and building a company. It's the same thing when it's going towards a dream. You know, it's like. You have to be impatient in your, I mean, you have to be extremely impatient in your day-to-day -day and patient in your long-term. And, and the more you get done in a day, the quicker you're going to get to that end goal. Most people are patient with their day-to-day. -day. I'll get that tomorrow. I'll get that to the end. I'll get to that later in the week. I'll, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll figure that out later. And then they're impatient. Like, why am I not a multimillionaire? Why am I not the biggest actor in the world? Why am I not, you know. In better shape. In, in better shape. Exactly. So the list goes on and on. And so you have to be, I would say those two things for me are probably the biggest is like the pain versus pleasure model and being consciously aware of that. And when you're doing something, realizing why you're doing it, like, why am I, like, is this just like, a, am I trying to numb something? You know, am I trying to like, I just, am I so stressed out that I need to stress eat? You know, like what, what is that thing? Why? And then figuring out the root of that on top of it is a whole other thing. But those are the things that I stick to, to help me stay motivated. You know, it's not about willpower. It's about discipline, right? It's, it's the pain versus pleasure. It's all the things that, that I just talked about. And if you can realize that and have the self-realization of yourself of why you're doing what you're doing, you'll have success in it, you know? Um, Draw, yeah, drawing into that why, right? Yeah, drawing into your why. So, uh, and leaning into that, you know, and trusting it and making sure that it's more powerful than the why not, you know? 
Um, but yeah, what, what about you? What is it for you? Honestly, like I really agree with everything you said and, um, it's, I might come at it from like a different approach because I think you did a perfect job of like the mainline motivating forces, right. Of like stick to your plan and don't, don't second guess yourself later when you're like actually have a goal and want to achieve it. Right. Yeah. Like that stood out to me of like, why am I not in better shape? Well, because you skipped the gym the last two weeks. Right. In yeah. time flies um, catches up on you. Right. No, totally. And like for me, I guess I'd come at it from a different perspective for the sake of like the conversation of like one, I try to have like happy feet, right? Like if my mind is telling me not to brush my teeth because I'm tired and don't want to get out of bed, use your happy feet to just take you in just like, Nope, happy feet. I'm, I'm moving in. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, I fucking hate brushing my teeth for some reason, even though I do it every night, I just hate it every night and it's really annoying. Um, but like, that's one example of just like force yourself to move and do something even when you don't want to. And then I have two other more like drawing from an intellectual standpoint where if it's a work thing, if it's a meeting, even though I'm like really tired, the meetings across town and like, man, do I really want to do this? I really, some of the stuff I'll draw from is family. And like, I think of my older brother making fun of me, like, don't be lazy, bro. Go do like, what are you talking about? Be a man. You know, like, like my an older brother would like a motivating yet, you know, sardonic force. Um, and then I, you know, think of like what my mom would say, like, well, this is your passion. You love this. And like, I want you to do it because you want to do it. Right. And like more from like a lovable mother <laughs> perspective. And for my dad, you know, like, like, what do you fucking think? Go to the fucking meeting. Like, what are you talking about? <laughs> you know? Like, so I kind of hear my family's voices in my head and like try to draw from like other people in my life or you, right? It'd be like, like, yeah, go to the fucking meeting. What are you talking? Like, but you'd say it in a very nice, sweet way. Yeah. I'd say always take the meeting, you know? Just yeah. Show like, up. like, dude, do you, you'd be like, do you really, you know, want to skip it? Like, won't you regret it if you don't go? Right. Like you'd say something dickish and caring like that. <laughs> Uh, no, I'm kidding. Um, but yeah, like, so I try to draw from specific people in my life um, and what they would say in that moment. I try to hear their voice if my voice is telling me to do something negative or irrational. Mm. Um, and then the other thing is really more of like, if I'm super tired, I mean, I almost had the opposite effect where this year I found myself um, writing until four in the morning a lot to a point where it was like very unhealthy for me. Um, cause what do you do when you go to bed at four or five? I mean, you're going to sleep in until at least 10 o'clock. Right. And then your sleep patterns completely effed up. And like, you're not as effective during the work day because you were up all night writing, even though you were working. And that's how I justified it in my head is like, but I'm getting work done. Yeah. Um, I'm being productive, but like, I still had to balance that. I almost had to like tune it back and be less productive at certain time periods so I could be more productive when everyone else is awake and working, <laughs> um, and doing something unhealthy for myself, even though it, like be productive in a healthy way yeah. at healthy time periods and healthy, like don't, it's the same concept of like, are you going to do a bunch of lines of cocaine to write a script? Well, I got it done. And it's nice. like, no, <laughs> you're not. Yeah. You're going to drink coffee to write a script. I and like, a, you know a, what I mean? I knew a guy who did that and I was like, you're oh, it's Hollywood your baby. Mind, bro. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's Hollywood baby. But um, yeah, it's like balancing the healthy methods, healthy times and techniques. Um, but yeah, drawing from other people that aren't me, um, combining healthy techniques and methods with, you know, productive hours, um, and then having happy feet of just go do it. And like with writing, especially you like, I don't believe in writer's block. I believe you're either going to write or you're not going to write. Um, and you have to sit down and just do it. Mm. And I like to start with like research. If I'm writing a Viking comic book, which I currently am, um, then I, okay, let me do an hour of research on Viking culture. 
what is the longhouse going to look like? How do they, how do they gather to like come up with like town uh, rules and like decide how are they going to go to war? Who, who's going to be in that council? Is there a council? Yeah. What does the healer hut look like? Maybe I'll look at concept art for it. And then that starts to get the juices flowing of like, oh, boom, I have this great idea. Like once you figure out how they do something, mm. you're like, here's how my characters would do that based off this research. I, I love that. Yeah. That's a, that's a really cool point because that's what I found in acting as well. So it sounds like it's extremely similar in writing as well. Um, is the better detective you are, the better you are at researching, you know, you basically become a student uh, of this character uh, yeah. and this story, the better your writing is going to be, the better your performance is going to be because you have more to pull from. You have, you have a more grounded uh, element that, that you can't just like make up because it's rooted in something now, you yep. know? Uh, you can make stuff up, right? But it'll be a different performance and you can see that in some of the greats, you know? And what I found is is the best ones are the best researchers. It doesn't mean they're the most creative or whatever it is. They're just the best at researching. I'm not saying totally. they're not, but at the same time, it's that. And Huge it's, part of the process. That's awesome. Huge part of the process. If you're going out for, you know, an Apache pilot, watch Black, Black Hawk Down, yeah. right? Like if you're going out for uh, Achilles, watch Troy, right? Like yeah, so, yeah. it's... You get the picture, but yeah. Um, but yeah, I think use research as a way to get over writer's block and begin the process of writing, even that. without actually writing. I love that. Yeah, so those points are amazing. Uh, happy Feet, that's my first time, I think, really hearing that. I think you've mentioned it before. Happy Obviously, Feet, we've baby. Been, we've been friends for a long time, I've heard that. Be a penguin. Um, but yeah, you have, those are great points. And mine were, you know, you know, find your why, make sure it's more powerful than your why not, essentially. Pain versus pleasure. And then being uh, impatient with your day-to-day and patient with your long-term goals. Exactly. Yeah. And like, it, and I guess like drawing from other people's voices in my head is kind of like the why, right? Yeah. It's like, yeah. what would other people tell me is the why, mm -hmm. essentially? Yeah. Yeah. As people that you care about, right? So you care about making them happy and, and them, them caring enough to tell you that stuff for you to be happy for yourself, right? A hundred percent. A hundred percent. That's awesome. But yeah, man. Another solid pod. I hope you all enjoy. Uh, we had a lot of fun here today. And until next time. I get the last word. Thank you for watching Studio 22. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. And follow our socials at Studio 22 Podcast.